why do you do what you do? To me, this is one of the most interesting questions that we can ask ourselves because there are really two parts to this question. One is why do you think you do what you do? What is your stated motivation, your mission, vision, whatever uh, in life? And then why do you actually do what you do? What are the subconscious processes and things running in the background of your brain that are pulling the strings and actually driving you to action? It's extremely hard to be honest with ourselves about these, these hidden motivations, the, these underlying drivers of our actions. And one of the big goals and projects of philosophy for basically all of human history has been to try to more deeply understand these motivations. We've been trying to figure this out for a long time. And a lot of us in a productive go-go-go culture focus on the first kind of motivation, having goals and having the thing that you're going after, why you say you do what you do. But that is probably much less powerful than the second kind, the subconscious motivation, the underlying forces that are driving your behavior. And in this book, The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker makes a very compelling case about what a big part of that hidden motivation in life is. And this is one of those books that completely changed my life. Uh, once I read it, I think about it often, I refer back to it a lot, certainly in, in other videos on this channel and in, in my short form videos as well, because not only is it beautifully written and fascinating and relatively easy to read, it makes this very compelling case about what some of these underlying motivations are and where a lot of our fears and anxieties about life come from. So today I'm going to share with you some of my favorite ideas from the book. It's really such a, a wonderful uh, work of nonfiction. If you've already read it, this might be a great refresher. If you haven't read it, this will give you some uh, great nuggets to pique your curiosity if you do want to go pick it up. And I think we should just dive right in. So Becker starts by outlining what he calls our tragic destiny. He says that each of us must desperately justify ourselves as an object of primary value in the universe. He must stand out, be a hero, make the biggest possible contribution to world life, show that he counts more than anything or anyone else. And this is, you know, we're talking here about these underlying uh, motivations in life. And Becker is saying that one of the core problems or core challenges that we have is that each of us on some level is driven to be significant, right? Is, is to matter. None of us wants to believe that when we die, we will have had no impact on the world around us. And he says that part of that comes from this mythical hero system that society seems to have always believed in to some extent. If you've read any of Joseph Campbell's work like Hero with a Thousand Faces or The Power of Myth, he talks a lot about how there are these recurring mythological themes. This hero's journey is probably the one that you've heard. And so many of our stories tie into this hero's journey. And, and what Becker seems to be kind of getting at here is that there's this dual relationship between the myth of the hero and this underlying challenge in our psyche. We are drawn to the hero myth because each of us wants to have uh, our own heroic impact uh, on the world. He says, it doesn't matter whether the cultural hero system is magical, religious, and primitive or secular, scientific and civilized. It is still a mythical hero system in which people serve in order to earn a feeling of primary value, of cosmic specialness, of ultimate usefulness to creation, of unshakable meaning. They earn this feeling by carving out a place in nature, by building an edifice that reflects human value, a temple, a cathedral, a totem pole, a skyscraper, a family that spans three generations. The hope and belief is that the things that man creates in society are of lasting worth and meaning, that they outlive or outshine death and decay, that man and his products count. And then he says that the, the modern fascination with science and technology is actually just the newest version of this hero myth. No matter how scientific or secular it claims to be, Western society is still as religious as any other. Civilized society is a hopeful belief and protest that science, money, and goods make man count for more than any other animal. In this sense, everything that man does is religious and heroic, and yet in danger of being fictitious and fallible. Okay, so we're already starting to tie in some of the ideas from earlier books, and this is kind of hinting at some of the problems with humanism that John Gray talked about in episode two, Straw Dogs, where we kind of abandoned the old religions and adopted this philosophy of humanism, where humans are special and our technology and achievements makes us more significant than other animals. But 
what Becker is saying is that this is basically just a new form of religion, a new way for us to try to achieve this cosmic significance, because whether we admit it or not, again, all of us are afraid that we don't fit into or that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. And while religion provided a sense of meaning and some cosmic significance, without that, we have to seek it elsewhere. And that's why he says that uh, science, money, and goods can make man count more than any other animal. And this is all in the introduction. This is how Becker's starting to introduce his ideas by saying that this is a core part of what motivates all of us. We all have some underlying fear that we don't matter, that we're not significant, that we won't have an impact on the world. And that's demonstrated and wrapped up in these perpetual hero myths. Uh, you could even say that obsession with video games uh, or with superhero movies are also other ways that we are playing out this need for meaning, significance, this need for heroics in our life today. We don't have any way to get it ourselves in our day-to-day -day life, so we seek it elsewhere, either in play or in watching someone else achieve it. And so Becker finishes the intro by saying, having laid this groundwork, we kind of know what each of us needs to think about if we take his assertions as true. To become conscious of what one is doing to earn his feeling of heroism is the main self-analytical problem of life. Everything painful and sobering in what psychoanalytic genius and religious genius have discovered about man revolves around the terror of admitting what one is doing to earn his self-esteem. This is why human heroics is a blind drivenness that burns people up. In passionate people, a screaming for glory as uncritical and reflexive as the howling of a dog. In the more passive masses of mediocre men, it is disguised as they humbly and complainingly follow out the roles that society provides for their heroics and try to earn their promotions within the system, wearing the standard uniforms but allowing themselves to stick out, but ever so little and so safely, with a little ribbon or a red boutonniere, but not with head and shoulders. So Becker's saying that if you accept that we all have this underlying fear, this underlying anxiety that our lives don't matter, then each of us is trying to achieve heroism in some way. In your job as somebody who wants to know and understand themselves is first and foremost to try to figure out what are you doing to feel heroic? And it requires a lot of honesty because sometimes it the answer might not be something that you like, or it might be that you're starting fights on social media because it gives you some feeling of importance. You might not like the answer to the question, but it's very important to ask it so that you can then further explore whether that is how you would want to potentially have a heroic impact on the world. Because what we're going to get into a little more later is that when we don't have a clear way to achieve that heroism, uh, we can often seek it out in other way, or we can often seek that meaning in other more destructive to ourselves in other ways. It says, man will lay down his life for his country, his society, his family. He will choose to throw himself on a grenade to save his comrades. He is capable of the highest generosity and self-sacrifice, but he has to feel and believe that what he is doing is truly heroic, timeless, and supremely meaningful. The crisis of modern society is precisely that the youth no longer feel heroic in the plan for action that their culture has set up. They don't believe it is empirically true to the problems of their lives and times. We are living in a crisis of heroism that reaches into every aspect of our social life. So, and this is, I think, one of the really beautiful and impressive things about this book is everything that we just cover is the first seven pages. He lays it out so well in the introduction that at root, each of us is motivated to have some significant impact on the world. We each want to be heroes, whether we admit it or not. Therefore, we need to identify what it is that we are doing to feel heroic. What? How do you create that feeling in yourself? How do you uh, scratch that itch? And is that a good way to scratch that itch or a bad way? And does the itch even need to be scratched at all? And then further, part of the problem of society today is that people don't feel heroic. They don't feel like they have a meaningful way to channel that heroism, either because there are not causes big enough that they care about or because they feel uh, unable to actually have any meaningful impact on the world. And so if we want to create a better society, if we want to create happier individuals, we need ways for each of us to become 
heroes of our own life, or we need to identify the ways that we are scratching this itch that might be harmful to ourselves and others. And a lot of that is what we're going to explore over the rest of the book. Now, before we go on though, I want to tell you about Readwise. So if you go to readwise.io slash net, you will find my absolute favorite reading tool. It is the best in class article reader. You can just plug it into your browser and then save any articles you come across, read them later on your phone or computer, highlight them, take notes. Uh, it's fantastic for reading articles without dealing with like tons of pop-ups and having everything saved for later. It is also the best way to organize all the notes that you're taking from books. So if you're reading on Kindle or Apple iBooks, you can just highlight as you're going and Readwise will automatically save them uh, to your Readwise account and send them to any note-taking tool you use. Or if you read physical books like I do, you can simply use their scanning tool where you can literally just take a picture of the page that you have a highlight on, select the highlight, and that is saved as well. It makes pulling highlights out of physical books that I've annotated so much easier. And Readwise honestly makes reading especially nonfiction or information dense books significantly more valuable. Being able to immediately find everything that you enjoy or learn from a book again in the future without having to dig around is really quite a game changer. So if you haven't checked it out, uh, definitely give it a look. It's just at readwise.io slash nat. All right, let's move on. So the topic that Becker gets into right after the introduction is our fear of death and how much that's motivating us. We might call this the existential paradox, the condition of individuality within finitude. Man has a symbolic identity that brings him sharply out of nature. He is a symbolic self, a creature with a name, a life history. He is a creator with a mind that soars out to speculate about atoms and infinity who can place himself imaginatively at a point in space and contemplate bemusedly his own planet. This immense expansion, this dexterity, this ethereality, this self-consciousness gives to man literally the status of a small god in nature as the Renaissance thinkers knew. Yet, at the same time, as the Eastern sages also knew, man is a worm and food for worms. This is the paradox. He is out of nature and hopelessly in it. He is dual, up in the stars and yet housed in a heart-pumping, breath-gasping body that once belonged to a fish and still carries the gill marks to prove it. Now, one, that just highlights what an incredible writer Becker is. I mean, those, those paragraphs are phenomenal, right? Just beautiful writing. He lays out this paradox so well, because if you go too deeply in either direction, either the, the Renaissance, you know, we are gods of, of our life, of nature, whatever, uh, school of thought, you eventually realize like, okay, but we still die, right? And they especially, or, and we, we can't even control what we do, <laughs> let alone what other people do. And John Gray put that really well in Star Dogs too, right? Like how can we pretend to be able to design an ideal society for other people when we can't even get ourselves to, you know, eat healthy day to day, right? Like the, even the most basic amounts of self-control often elude us. So we're clearly not these gods, yet we can imagine this whole uh, universe, right? We, we can do all these incredible things with our mind that make us feel like gods. These semi-omnipotent thinking things, and yet we also have to eat and poop, right? And we're going to die. <laughs> That's the big one, right? We're, we're going to die eventually. And so how do we reconcile that? Well, one of the, the big challenges is this terror of death, as Becker puts it. And according to him, the reason that this hero myth is so exalted in our minds is because our biggest underlying fear, even if we might claim it's something else, it is actually death. He says, heroism is first and foremost a reflex of the terror of death. We admire most the courage to face death. We give such valor our highest and most constant adoration. The hero was the man who could go into the spirit world, the world of the dead, and return alive. And he goes on to say how the divine hero in basically every religion and cult is the one who transcended death. The divine hero of each of these cults was one who had come back from the dead. And as we know today from the research into ancient myths and rituals, Christianity itself was a competitor with the mystery cults and won out, among other reasons, because it too featured a healer with supernatural powers who had risen from the dead. These cults and religions were an attempt to attain an immunity bath from the greatest evil, death, and the dread of it. So he's saying that, one, we create heroes and we look up to heroes because they're often the ones who have transcended death in some way or defied it or shown a lack of fear in the face of it. And so many of our religions center around figures who also transcended death, who came back from the dead or who had some 
promise of rebirth or immortality because by uh, connecting ourselves to those myths, we can hope that we too can eventually transcend death, our greatest fear. And part of why we want to attach ourselves to those heroes, why we want to exalt these stories is, again, because we have that fear of death, and that fear of death is actually a completely natural thing for us all to have. It's something we would expect there to be. He says, Animals, in order to survive, have had to be protected by fear responses in relation not only to other animals, but to nature itself. They had to see the real relationship of their limited powers to the dangerous world in which they were immersed. Reality and fear go together naturally. As the human infant is in an even more exposed and helpless situation, it is foolish to assume that the fear response of animals would have disappeared in such a weak and highly sensitive species. It is more reasonable to think that it was instead heightened, as some of the early Darwinians thought. Early men who were most afraid were, the, were those who were most realistic about their situation in nature, and they passed on to their offspring a realism that had a high survival value. The result was the emergence of man as we know him, a hyper-anxious animal who constantly invents reasons for anxiety, even when there are none. So we can think of a lot of this as just a natural consequence of evolution and how our brains had to adapt over time. Naturally, the most anxious and fearful of us were probably the ones who survived within reason, right? Because they would have been the ones who heard a rustling in the bushes and ran away or at least investigated it. They didn't brush it off. The ones who weren't anxious about that stuff probably didn't make it. But then because we have this very strong latent anxiety about the things around us and because we can conceptualize death, we can imagine these terrifying things, we become these hyper anxious animals who are always inventing something to be afraid of. And that's something that I think resonates with a lot of people, where even if you're in an objectively good situation, you almost can't enjoy it. You feel like something something must be wrong, right? But like if too many good things happen, there must be is something else coming, coming down the pipe, right? And, and we can even think of this as another form of hedonic adaptation, right? Where you stop enjoying things very quickly, not necessarily because you get used to them, but because you feel like there must be something else you need to do to be safe. The additional bits of security that you earn in your life just give way to new anxieties, and, and that's all a very natural thing. So we have this terror of death, we are these very anxious creatures, and so we idolize these heroes who can uh, seemingly ignore that anxiety, who can fight back against it, who can face death. But then the question is, so why are so few people courageous? Why aren't you more courageous? Why do we not face up more admirably to the challenges of life? And, and more importantly, really, why aren't we fully living the life that many of us think we deserve? Well, Beckard lays out what I think is a very compelling argument, and he's drawing on Abraham Maslow here, the guy who came up with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow says, We fear our highest possibility as well as our lowest ones. We are generally afraid to become that which we can glimpse in our most perfect moments. We enjoy and even thrill to the godlike possibilities we see in ourselves in such peak moments, and yet simultaneously shiver with weakness, awe, and fear before the very same possibilities. Now, Becker explains that Maslow called this the Jonas Syndrome. And apparently Maslow thought of the Jonas Syndrome as the evasion of the full intensity of life. Reading from Maslow again, We are just not strong enough to endure more. It is just too shaking and too wearing. So often people in ecstatic moments say, It's too much, or I can't stand it, or I could die. Delirious happiness cannot be borne for long. Our organisms are just too weak for any large doses of greatness. And so Becker explains that the Jonas Syndrome, seen from this basic point of view, is a justified fear of being torn apart, of losing control, of being shattered and disintegrated, even of being killed by the experience. And the results of this syndrome is what we would expect a weak organism to do, to cut back the full intensity of life. Reading from Maslow again, For some people, this evasion of one's own growth, setting low levels of aspiration, the fear of doing what one is capable of doing, voluntarily self-crippling, pseudo-stupidity, mock humility, are in fact defenses against grandiosity. Now, I, I love this concept so much that, that most of us choose to live a simpler, less ambitious, less courageous life because we are afraid of what it would mean if we truly lived up to our potential. There is some latent fear on the one hand that could be the experience would be too much, right? That we couldn't handle it. But I think there is also this strong fear 
that if we try to live up to it and we fail, we will be destroyed by it. Becker actually goes on and says, it all boils down to a simple lack of strength to bear the superlative, to open oneself to the totality of experience, an idea that was well appreciated by William James and more recently was developed in phenomenological terms in the classic work of Rudolf Otto. And he basically goes on to say that we're so overwhelmed by our incredible potential that we just shrink back in fear and aim for something smaller instead. This is something that I think we can all ask ourselves, right? Because on one level, many of us know what we want to be doing with our life, what we wish we were spending our time on, how we wish we were being heroic or how we wish we were contributing to the world. And then the question you have to ask yourself is, are you not going after that because you are afraid of it in some way? Are you afraid of what it would mean if you failed? Are you afraid of who you would be if you succeeded? And we will often create these false reasons for not going after it as excuses to self-soothe our own weakness, right? Or reading the Maslow quotation again, for some people, this evasion of one's own growth, setting low levels of aspiration, the fear of doing what one is capable of doing, voluntarily self-crippling, pseudo-stupidity, and mock humility. Those are all defenses against grandiosity. So if you're setting goals that you know you can achieve, if you're self-sabotaging in some way, then these are all symptoms that you are afraid of your own potential. And if you can get past them, if you can risk failing at the big thing in life, then you might actually achieve that incredible vision of yourself that you imagine when you allow yourself to. But there's this other idea here about the things that cause us to fear our grandiosity, about our, our anxieties and our struggles. Becker says, man is driven toward the things that support the lie of his character, his automatic equanimity, but he is also drawn precisely toward those things that make him anxious as a way of skirting them masterfully, testing himself against them, controlling them by defying them. And he goes on and explains that we often become obsessed with the things that annoy us or upset us or make us anxious because by struggling against them, we can exert some degree of a feeling of self-control or a feeling of control over our lives. And so instead of just moving up to a higher plane of our own existence, of ignoring the things that are causing us these anxieties and moving beyond them, we choose to struggle with them instead and make them one of the focuses of our existence because we don't want to go after these big grand aspirations. We just want to fight at this lower level because that, that struggle gives us a little bit of a, of a sense of control. And he explains too that when you lack a strong source of meaning in your day-to-day -day existence in your life, you will find some smaller thing to struggle against instead. Again, if you find that you're always complaining about the same people or the same things, or you feel like there are these you know, adversaries online or something that you need to go out and fight, that might just be a symptom that you don't have a strong source of meaning in your life. And you need to go figure out what it is you could be pouring your time into that would provide that instead of picking these battles with your own fears and anxieties. And so he, he ties some of this together at the end of this, this chapter on our character and how we, how we lie to ourselves, where he says that the irony of man's condition is that the deepest need is to be free of the anxiety of death and annihilation, but it is life itself which awakens it. And so we must shrink from being fully alive. This is the real challenge that we have to contend with. We're all afraid of dying, whether we admit it or not. And truly living or truly being in the moment, truly uh, committing our energies to the most important work of our life means coming closer to observing and seeing just how bad death would be. It means becoming more comfortable with that. And this could be like an existential or, or a psychological death too, not just a physical one, right? If failure, your most important work would be a kind of psychological death. And so we have this choice. We can either be courageous and live up to that fear of death, or we can shrink back from life, live a smaller existence. And most of us choose to do the latter. And so what would be a sign that you are in the latter camp, right? That you are somebody who is shirking away from their life. Well, he introduces this concept of the automatic cultural man, which uh, was originally written about by Kierkegaard. He says, this is a perfect description of the automatic cultural man. Man is confined by culture, a slave to it, who imagines that he has an identity if he pays his insurance premium, that he has control of his life if he guns his sports car or works his electric toothbrush. He says that most men spare themselves trouble by keeping their minds on the small problems of their lives, just as their society maps these problems out for them. These are the immediate men and the Philistines. They tranquilize themselves with the trivial, and so they can lead normal lives. 
So a good sign that you are shirking away from the full potential of your life is if you are overly fixated on trivia or the culture of the day, right? Are you obsessed with the current thing on social media or the news or what celebrities and influencers are doing? How much of your life revolves around just what's going on today in the world that everybody else is talking about, right? That is the trivial that we become obsessed with to shirk away from our lives, right? The, and obviously more time spent just watching TV would be another good example of this, right? Or just reading the most recent books that came out and not uh, diving into like older, better material, right? I, I think the easiest way to index this is how much of your time and attention goes towards the media of the day that's being fed to you versus what you want to create and see in the world and what you want to seek out and find that resonates most strongly with you. And this is another theme that, that has come up quite a bit, that you sort of have this choice, right? Uh, John Gray talked about this, Schopenhauer talked about this, Montaigne talked about this a little bit. You can really either see the finiteness of life, you can see our mortality, you can see the fact that we are both these mini gods and food for worms, and you can try to embrace it and live it and fulfill your highest calling, or you can choose not to and you can shirk back from life. He says that while one sort of despair plunges wildly into the infinite and loses itself, a second sort permits itself as if it were to be defrauded by the others. By seeing the multitude of men about it, by getting engaged in all sorts of worldly affairs, by becoming wise about how things go on in this world, such a man forgets himself, does not dare to believe in himself, finds it too venturesome a thing to be himself, far easier and safer to be like the others, to become an imitation, a number, a cipher in the crowd. There is some discord amongst other philosophers talk about this. Some, like I think Becker uh, and Kierkegaard are saying is that this is just blanket sad, right? If you're being just a culture person, an NPC or whatever, then that's sad. But Gray's take on this is kind of interesting too, where he says that, that's okay. <laughs> if you don't want to think about your mortality every day, if you don't want to try to change the world, build pyramids or whatever, you should just pick up a strong religion or get obsessed with fantasy football or watch every TV show on Hulu, right? Because that is the closest that you will come to happiness otherwise, right? Like that's an okay fate. And that is probably the faith that most people are going to choose. But if you do aspire to do something, and if you're honest with yourself about those aspirations, then you have to be willing to turn away from the seductions of being an automatic cultural man. And if you decide that you don't want to be an NPC, you don't want to be an automatic cultural man, then uh, there are certain things you have to do. And one of those is kind of removing your psychological, secure reliance on society. So he, he later says, each child grounds himself in some power that transcends him. Usually it is a combination of his parents, his social group, and the symbols of his society and nation. This is the unthinking web of support which allows him to believe in himself as he functions on the automatic security of delegated powers. So this is how we all start in life, right? As a child, you're obviously more vulnerable. You can't really be self-sufficient yet. And so you rely on external sources of security. But he goes on to say that you can only really be a fully self-actualized person if you can move that locus of security back internally. As long as you are still relying on your parents or your peers or your maybe your religious community as that source of security, then you're still in some ways kind of like a child. And one thing that he says is that if you admit that you are a creature, if you admit that you're just another animal, you accomplish one basic thing. You demolish all your unconscious power linkages or supports. I believe that what he's saying is that if you can admit that, or if you can at least think along the lines of, okay, I'm food for worms, then you recognize that a lot of these external uh, sources of security are kind of just like imagined, right? Like they're, they're just means of coping. And if you think of yourself as just this animal that also has the, this mind uh, operating inside of it, then maybe you can bring some of that sort of security back uh, inside yourself. And this is where it creates, or this is where he gets into kind of an interesting relationship with religion and God. And he's talking a lot about Kierkegaard's ideas here. He says that actual real freedom and real security 
is by building a deeper relationship with that ultimate power that resides in you. It's almost hard to tell how much he's talking about God in a like Judeo-Christian sense, talking about God as a more universal idea, or merely talking about these kind of infinite powers of our mind. He says, once the person begins to look to his relationship to the ultimate power, to infinitude, and to refashion his links from those around him to that ultimate power, he opens up to himself the horizon of unlimited possibility of real freedom. And this is a really powerful idea that true self-confidence, true self-worth, true security comes from deeply linking yourself, deeply connecting yourself with that kind of infinite power within your mind or with that infinite power within God and the universe. I think you could read this both ways. I will say that Kierkegaard is very clearly saying that this is like God, <laughs> that you need to have faith. And I'm not going to say that's wrong, right? Because that, that is another interesting way to uh, read this idea. Uh, but it also has this kind of clarification that this is like a very personal internal faith. It is not a reliance on like the church per se. I think either interpretation of it works. You could see it as like a more secular internal unlimited power that we have available to us in our minds, or you could see it as this deeper connection to the power of the universe around us. He goes on and says that man breaks through the bounds of merely cultural heroism. He destroys the character lie that had him perform as a hero in the everyday social scheme of things, and by doing so, he opens himself up to infinity, to the possibility of cosmic heroism, to the very service of God. His life thereby acquires ultimate value in place of merely social and cultural historic value. He links his secret inner self, his authentic talent, his deepest feelings of uniqueness, his inner yearning for absolute significance to the very ground of creation. Out of the ruins of the broken cultural self, there remains the mystery of the private, invisible inner self, which yearned for ultimate significance for cosmic heroism. The invisible mystery at the heart of every creature now attains causing significance by affirming its connection with the invisible mystery at the heart of creation. This is the meaning of faith. I mean, it's such an interesting take on faith. It's all one that I had heard articulated quite like this, although it sounds like this is how Kierkegaard argues it. But it, it provides such an interesting way to think about developing that self-confidence, developing that heroism, that ability to go after your most authentic self. You have to remove your reliance on external sources of security, external sources of meaning, bring them into yourself, make, you know, really create an internal locus of control and belief and base that in some kind of faith in this greater, higher power in the universe. And it, I might be reading my own biases into it, but it really does feel like that type of faith can go in kind of any direction that works best for you, because ultimately it is still this internal feeling or it is still this internal relationship and so you can really take that faith however you want it and so this is kind of what becker is saying here channeling kierkegaard is the solution to these great anxieties of life as long as man is an ambiguous creature he can never banish anxiety what he can do instead is to use anxiety as an eternal spring for growth into new dimensions of thought and trust faith poses a new life task the advantage and openness to a multidimensional reality. And I'm not a particularly religious person, but I do just, there's something about this idea of faith as this internal source of security and connection to the infinite nature of reality that I find really beautiful uh, and very compelling. So what happens if we don't bring that sense of security back inside, if we don't create uh, a source of meaning uh, in the world that is really, really like, deeply resonant within us. Well, then we tend to look for that source of meaning elsewhere. We engage in a form of transference. And Becker is quoting Eric Fromm here. He says, in order to overcome his sense of inner emptiness and impotence, man chooses an object onto whom he projects all his own human qualities, his love, intelligence, courage, etc. By submitting to this object, he feels in touch with his own qualities. He feels strong, wise, courageous, and secure. To lose the object means the danger of losing himself. This mechanism, idolatric worship of an object based on the fact of the individual's alienation, is the central dynamism of transference, that which gives transference its strength and intensity. Now, obviously, you've seen children do a version of this, right? They have a stuffed animal that's their favorite, and they bring it with them everywhere because it makes them feel secure. But a lot of adults who don't have a strong 
inner sense of meaning or security will do this too, but they might uh, project it onto a sports team or a political uh, leaning, right? Or a political candidate who they really want to win or not win. Uh, they might project it onto whatever the fight of the day is on social media. We still have that strong internal sense of meaning. And so we look for it elsewhere, right? We just latch on to things. Becker says that this use of the transference object explains the urge to deification of the other, the constant placing of certain select persons on pedestals, the reading into them of extra powers. The more they have, the more rubs off on us. We participate in their immortality, and so we create immortals. As Harrington put it graphically, I am making a deeper impression on the cosmos because I know this famous person. When the ark sails, I will be on it. Man is always hungry, as Rank Soul put it, for material for his own immortalization. The groups need it too, which explains the constant hunger for heroes. So again, if we don't feel like we can be heroic ourselves, we will pick someone or something in the world to treat as a hero instead. And then by associating ourselves with them, by fighting for them, by defending them or fighting against them, then we achieve our own little bits of heroism, our own opportunity at immortality. But the problem is that all of these external sources of meaning, these other heroes, right, they are... Uh, we, we end up attacking them or we end up fighting back against them eventually. This is the reason for so much bitterness, shortness of temper, and recrimination in our daily family lives. We get back a reflection from our loved objects that is less than the grandeur and perfection that we need to nourish ourselves. We feel diminished by their human shortcomings. Our interiors feel empty or anguished, our lives valueless when we see the inevitable pettiness of the world expressed through the human beings in it. For this reason, too, we often attack loved ones and try to bring them down to size. We see that our gods have clay feet, and so we must hack away at them in order to save ourselves, to deflate the unreal overinvestment that we have made in them in order to secure our own apotheosis. In this sense, the deflation of the overinvested partner, parent, or friend is a creative act. It is necessary to correct the lie that we have been living, to reaffirm our own inner freedom of growth that transcends the particular object and is not bound to it. But not everybody can do this because many of us need the lie in order to live. We may have no other God and we may prefer to deflate ourselves in order to keep the relationship, even though we glimpse the possibility, the impossibility of it and the slavishness to which it reduces us. This is one direct explanation, as we shall see, of the phenomenon of depression. So this transference of heroism onto somebody else, this reliance of others for that sense of heroism eventually backfires. We start to see the imperfections. We see that our gods have clay feet, and so we end up attacking them. And that could be lashing out against authority figures, could be lashing out against partners. Uh, we, we end up attacking the things that we love most or are obsessed over. Or as we see this Kind of actual limited potential in the world, we end up dimming our own light because if our heroes, if our gods are this fallible, then we must be even more fallible. And so we shrink away from life even further. But lest this all seem a little too <laughs> depressing, it, Becker does provide some very compelling advice on actually how to live, how to resolve these paradoxes and challenges. And the first is to try to engage more fully with life. To live is to engage in experience, at least partly on the terms of the experience itself. One has to stick his neck out in the action without any guarantees about satisfaction or safety. One never knows how it will come out or how silly he will look, but the neurotic type wants these guarantees. He doesn't want to risk his self-image. Rank calls this very aptly the self-willed overvaluation of self, whereby the neurotic type tries to cheat nature. He won't pay the price that nature wants of him, to age, to fall ill, or be injured and die. Instead of living experience, he ideates it. Instead of arranging it in action, he works it all out in his head. So the first way to actually be alive is be willing to engage in life on its own terms. If you're highly neurotic, controlling perfectionist, then you don't want to do anything unless you can control all the variables, but life doesn't work that way. You have to be willing to risk death, to risk aging, to risk things not going the way you want if you want to be able to engage with life as authentically as possible. And so neuroticism is really a huge hindrance to a fulfilled and happy life here because the more neurotic you are, the more wrapped up you are in the outcomes and in control, the unhappier you're going to be as a result. 
But then the big challenge is that if you're engaging with the world authentically, you're going to see all of these imperfections, all these problems, all these challenges in it. Uh, but there's a, there's a solution for that, so to speak. Either you eat up yourself and others around you trying for perfection, or you objectify that imperfection in a work on which you can then unleash your creative powers. In this sense, some kind of objective creativity is the only answer man has to the problem of life. In this way, he satisfies nature, which asks that he live and act objectively as a vital animal plunging into the world. But he also satisfies his own distinctive human nature because he plunges in on his own symbolic terms and not as a reflex of the world as given to mere physical sense experience. He takes in the world, makes a total problem out of it, and then gives out a fashioned human answer to that problem. This, as Guthasan Faust, is the highest that man can achieve. So once we start engaging with the world, we will see all the imperfections, all the problems in it. And one thing that we're tempted to do is try to fix all of them, right? Try to control the people around us, try to control the environment around us in order to resolve all these things that we see as broken. But that is not how to live a happy life, according to Becker. Instead, you take the imperfection you see in the world and you channel it into your own creative project, into your own source of meaning you create some kind of solution some piece of art or uh i mean this could be a company this could be a family you create something to bring more perfection into the world instead of trying to change everything uh outside of you and this allows you to live in both worlds you are still this animal kind of reacting to the various stimuli around you but you are creating something that has a little bit of that infinite mental possibility attached to it. You're, you're bridging both sides of the paradox. He goes on to say that, you know, in relating to this kind of infinite capacity while stuck in this physical form, man needs a second world, a world of humanly created meaning, a new reality that he can live, dramatize, and nourish himself in. Illusion means creative play at its highest level. Cultural illusion is a necessary ideology of self-justification, a heroic dimension that is life itself to the symbolic animal. So you need both worlds. You need the physical, real animal world that you live in, and you need this world of ideas, this creative place where you can express yourself and the problems you see in the world. Because if you can't do that, then you'll be stuck in, in this sort of horribly depressed life. He says, modern man is drinking and drugging himself out of awareness where he spends his time shopping, which is the same thing. As awareness calls for types of heroic dedication that his culture no longer provides for him, society contrives to help him forget. Or alternatively, he buries himself in psychology in the belief that awareness all by itself will be some kind of magical cure for his problems. So if we're not willing to fully engage in life, if we're not willing to walk these two worlds, to find something to pour ourselves into, to kind of like be courageous and, and stand up and, and face this potential for death, then we will naturally be inclined towards drinking and drugging ourselves out of existence and numbing that awareness of our failure to live up to our potential. And then he ends with this last piece of advice. He says, who knows what form the forward momentum of life will take in the time ahead or what use it will make of our anguished searching. The most that any of us can seem to do is to fashion something an object or ourselves and drop it into the confusion, make an offering of it, so to speak, to the life force. And I love that ending because the last piece of kind of just interesting trivia about the book is that uh, Becker was diagnosed with cancer at 48. And then he wrote this book over the next year, year and a half, and then died six or 12 months after it was published. So he knew he was going to die quite soon while writing this book. And it gives that little extra bit of meaning because it's coming from someone who was grappling with death. If you've read When Breath Becomes Air, that's another great book that lets you see some of that psychology. And so knowing that this man knows he's going to die in the next year and him leaving this wisdom, the most that any of us can seem to do is to fashion something, an object or ourselves, and drop it into the confusion, make an offering of it, so to speak, to the life force. There's something really powerful about that, that at the end of life, somebody who was a you know, very esteemed psychologist uh, and writer in his time, you know, that's basically what he was saying is all we can hope to do, is to make some kind of offering to the life force, some source of meaning that, that resonates with us. And then aside from that, accept that we are all stuck in these finite, limited corporeal beings. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, please send it to a friend. That is the best way for this podcast to continue to exist. And thank you to everyone who's already done that. 
Aside from that, if you could leave a review on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you listen to podcasts, or like and subscribe on YouTube, those are all great ways to support the show. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.